dear friends of HRNK, uh, good morning, and of course, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. It is a uh, very pleasant day in Washington, D.C., nice temperature, not too hot, a very nice light breeze, a great day for a Zoom program. Uh, we have a uh, terrific guest today. By the way, I'm Greg Scarlatti, Executive Director of the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, HRNK, based in Washington, D.C., uh, our report author and uh, senior advisor, uh, Joseph S. Bermudez Jr., is going to present his latest report in a collaboration, Joe, that goes back, I want to say, 10 years. As soon as I became um, executive director of HRK in July of 2011, uh, Joe called me and um, asked for ideas um, for a possible collaboration. So. Um, Joe and HRNK decided to proceed with a project that establishes baseline surveys of detention facilities in North Korea and um, provides updates on these facilities. Uh, Joe Bermudez um, is one of the world's top satellite imagery analysts. I would say the top satellite imagery analyst a household name, uh, of course, Joe is senior advisor and author with HRNK, where he covers North Korean human rights, the detention facilities in particular. Um, Joe has served the United States and the people of the United States for many decades. There is a um, tradition and a history of service in Joe's family. I hope we can talk about this a little bit today. Um, Joe's father was a great inspiration to him as a, a fighter for re redress for victims of genocide and justice. And Joe has decided to do this. He won't say it himself. He's, he's too modest to do that. But uh, Joe does this work with us out of passion, out of a passion for human rights, for justice, for bringing human rights, freedom, and justice to other fellow human beings. The facility that Joe is going to feature today is North Korea's long-term prison labor facility, a Kyohua So. And of course, as followers of HRNK, you all remember the difference. A Kuali So is a political prison camp. A Kyohua So is a long-term prison labor facility. As you will see in this report and in Joe's presentation and the other reports, over the past many years, we have also discovered that political prisoners are also held at uh, these Kyohaso detention facilities. Uh, Joe, thank you for everything you do, and uh, thank you for this report, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. Uh, you're most, mel uh, most welcome. And uh, uh, the introduction was uh, far more than I really deserve. Uh, this, uh, this report of the Sung Ho Reef facility uh, was actually quite interesting and quite informative to myself as an analyst and a researcher. We had originally done one on a facility, uh, which turns out to be part of the Sung Ho Ri facility. Uh, we uh, initially called it the Pok Chang Ni or Pok Chang Ri uh, facility, and we detailed it in a previous report. We subsequently acquired uh, additional imagery. We had the uh, great opportunity to interview a former prisoner at the camp. And I had the opportunity to speak with a number of people who had some knowledge of the facility. So together, we, I, I took all this information and with Greg and Rose's assistance, uh, began to look at the facility in a broader context. Initially, we thought it was just this one facility uh, at Pokchang Ri, but was, you know, sometimes called Sunko Ri because it's in the the uh, district of Sungo. Uh, but as we did, and we took the information from the defector and the other, not defector, I apologize, the former prisoner, and we put it together, we identified additional facilities and we identified uh, locations and activities and verified what we were being told by this small prisoner, which is a great, great opportunity. Uh, so we extended the report we placed the original facility within a broader context. 
and the end result is this report. Uh, the original facility of Pukchang Mi uh, is actually a component of at least seven prisons that are part of the Sung Ho Ri facility. And unlike uh, facilities in the South or in the United States, these facilities are distributed around the district, which makes it challenging to identify. And this is where interviews with former prisoners come in uh, very, very handy, very, very useful. So as best we can tell from the available commercial satellite imagery, uh, the facility at Sungho, the facilities that we'll be talking about that are part of Sungho Re, uh, were established in the late 1980s. When additional information becomes available, when additional declassified satellite imagery becomes available, that covers the 1980s and the 1990s, we'll be able to refine that much, much better. And hopefully we'll be able to interview additional uh, escapees who were prisoners there or who were prisoners in nearby facilities who knew something about this facility. So view this as a work in progress being refined as additional information becomes available. Within the Puk Chang Ni facility, there are actually two prisons. So we in the West think of a prison as a single unitary facility. That isn't how it works here. There is a prison, uh, prison number two, which is composed primarily of males, men, you know, both of all ages for that matter. And they're primarily concerned with uh, working in the nearby uh, limestone mines, coal mines, uh, and things of that nature. The uh, prison number three out of the seven is composed of females. And these females are engaged in agricultural activity in the land around the prison, and also in uh, producing eyelashes or putting eyelashes on dolls for Chinese customers, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it's also probably extremely tedious work. So among the facilities that uh, we have identified that are associated with the Pukchang Ni facility is the Kumok uh, Cement Factory, the Kumok Railroad Station, and the Kumok uh, Limestone Mine. Now, as these were, you know, as we were informed of these facilities, uh, we broadened the search. We went looking for them. They were quite easily identified and it fits the descriptions which the uh, former prisoner had told us and other information that we'd received. And we began to piece this together. And as we're doing this, um, we came across two other facilities that are most likely, most probably part of the Sunho Reef facility. We don't have numbers of those prisons yet, but their uh, physical makeup, that they have walled, high walled facilities, that they have guard towers, that they have single entrances, clearly identify them as detention facilities. We have provisionally called them Kandal 1 and Kandal 2. The, the reason for these provisional names is, as I said, we don't know the names, but they're near the tiny village of Kandal. And typically that's the way you associate a name with a, a facility that you don't know. Okay, as far as we can tell, <clears throat> the Kumdal prison was, uh, was in, in place before 2004. That's the earliest image we have of it. The declassified imagery we have from the 1970s into the 1980s doesn't you know, uh, show this facility. So between you know, 1980 and 2004, it was established. Uh, kind of frustrating for research and not to narrow it down, but uh, we're, as Greg had mentioned, this is an ongoing project. And as we move forward, we hope to identify uh, more precisely when it was established. Kumdol II was established somewhere around 2007, 2008, maybe is being built as late as 2011. Uh, what's interesting about these two facilities is they're 
they're adjacent to each other. They were actually separated by, you know, a couple hundred meters. If you look in the report, it'll tell you exactly how far they were separated. But in 2020, we saw an interesting development. We saw that walls were built connecting the two. These, are, these were high, you know, security walls. And it appears as if they're going to break through the walls and make this a combined camp possibly, or keep the two camps, two prisons separated within this facility. From what we know about these, these facilities, as I mentioned, uh, prison number two at Puk Chung Mi, uh, the men are used for mining, uh, not only coal, but also sand and gravel, limestone at the near my mine. This is then brought across the railroad tracks to the cement factory where cement is produced and shipped out to various projects in you know, central North Korea, southern North Korea. Um, anybody who's ever opened a bag of cement will notice that this fine powder goes everywhere. Uh, those working uh, at the factory, those working on the limestone, limestone is crushed and made into a powder, will uh, immediately realize how uh, without the pr proper safety gear, this is a very hazardous uh, occupation as the lungs get coated and they cause respiratory illness and injury. For those working in the nearby coal mines, uh, like those at the Kumdol facilities, uh, we know from numerous interviews with defectors, with uh, escapees, with former prisoners, that the safety record in the coal mines is horrific. And they're forced to work with inferior equipment. Even the propaganda images that North Korea uh, publishes show a lack of true safety concern and primitive equipment. Such conditions lead uh, obviously to hazards and these hazards lead to accidents and the accident rate in mines is reported to be very high. Uh, it's not possible this time to really give you a precise number uh, because the, uh, the numbers vary considerably and that's not necessarily inaccurate because the numbers that come to us are from different periods of time. So we need to be careful and we're being conservative in our analysis so as to provide the best information to the public, to the governments, the policy people. Uh, we, uh, we noticed several things about all these facilities. And I'm not only talking about the two prisoner facilities, uh, three prison facilities, but the associated industrial facilities is that they're constant being minor changes. Uh, in some cases uh, at uh, Pok Chang Ni, there was a major reorganization of the facility where they established uh, an internal camp within the larger camp. And this happened, oh, roughly 2012, 2013. And it's remained relatively steady in, since that period of time, but we see minor changes. Uh, we see the minor changes at, as I mentioned, at the Kumdal facilities. We see minor changes at the cement factory and the quarry for limestone and sand. What this tells us is these facilities are active. You don't update facilities unless they are active. Okay. And what we've uh, heard and what we've been told uh, validates that all these facilities are operational. Okay. Uh, they're well-maintained. If you look at the satellite imagery, you see that uh, the, facility, it's, the facilities themselves are neat. They're organized. Uh, I wanna say clean, but that would uh, imply that I can actually see paper on the ground and I really can't. But occasionally we do see people moving around within the facilities. We see vehicles coming to and leaving the facilities. Uh, we also sometimes very rarely see groups in formation. Uh, it's difficult to tell whether these are being prisoners marched somewhere or these are part of the security guards. Uh, the imagery has been quite remarkable. You know, you look down at the facility and uh, there should be a link in the report 
that'll show you a 3D rendering that was done by Nathan Hunt that provides you with a great perspective on the facility and how it looks. Uh, as, as, you, as you look at the facilities, you see that the North Greens have done things in a very logical way, uh, certainly in a very North Korean way. Uh, you have prisoners who work the fields and produce agriculture. There appears to be an orchard just north of the Pokchang Ni facility, and it's being maintained. However, reports indicate that the prisoners do not receive the benefits of all this food that's being produced. It goes uh, to the government, certainly, but it goes to the prison guards and administration, and the uh, prisoners themselves receive very little. Overall, uh, the Pokchang facility has been reported to have 1,500 uh, to 1,600 uh, detainees at any one time. Some estimates go high, as high as 2,000. I can certainly, uh, from satellite imagery and using certain uh, techniques and standards of measurement, uh, I can certainly say that this facility is certainly capable of holding up to 2,000 uh, detainees, prisoners. The last report we had out of approximately 1,600 prisoners, 500, 550 were females who were working in uh, prison number three. And those were the ones that were uh, performing the uh, agricultural activity and also the, uh, the manufacture of the uh, doll eyelashes and the placing of them on the dolls. We also um, look at the uh, facilities, as I mentioned before, at the uh, cement factory, at the quarry, the mine, uh, and see that there's activity there. Activity means it's operational. And, and these are the part of the things we need to see. Uh, we see guard posts and, and entry points that are secured. Once again, it, it indicates that these are detention facilities. At the Cumbal facilities, we see trails leading from the facilities to nearby mine shafts. Okay. And these trails are, uh, are there. They're uh, being used because if they weren't being used, you would see vegetation starting to grow. You'd see erosion um, you know, taking its effect on those trails. So we know that the people at the Kumdal facilities are being used to mine coal. One of the things that was also interesting was when we were speaking with uh, the former prisoner and Amanda O oh, uh, conducted the interview, uh, they spoke of during winter, the prisoners, all the prisoners would be taken to the nearby uh, tailings piles of the mines. So when you mine coal, you bring it out, you crush it up and you ship it out. <clears throat> well, some of that is mixed with uh, non-coal uh, minerals, rocks, and this goes into a tailings pile, a waste pile, but there's still coal in there. And these prisoners go out in winter and they uh, pick through the tailings pile and bring back the coal. Most of that is used for the prison uh, guards and administration, but a little is provided to the actual prisoners uh, to keep somewhat warm. Uh, the challenge with this is that they really don't have a means of controlling uh, the heat from these things. And there have been reported injuries from being burned sometimes very severely from these open little coal fires. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, there's also the uh, issue of if you're in a closed space with a coal fire without a uh, flue or chimney, uh, this can lead to uh, respiratory disease and stress. So this is something you know we need to consider. The health of the prisoners, you know, there, there, in addition to the health issues, uh, there are numerous accounts of beatings, uh, sometimes described as torture. Uh, torture is normally when you're trying to extract something from somebody. Uh, I imagine that these people have already been, anything that's been extracted that's worthwhile uh, has been done already, but uh, they're certainly beaten and, you know, certainly beaten, certainly deprived of 
proper nutrition, uh, proper housing, proper health care. And this, this makes them vulnerable, it makes them vulnerable uh, emotionally, mentally, physically, for sure. So when we get the opportunity to uh, see these camps in person, and it, it's truly my hope that we do have that opportunity, that we uh, catalog the illnesses, the injuries that these people have suffered, and we also identified those who were responsible. It's important to bring justice to these people. You know, uh, most of these people, as best we can tell, were uh, either falsely accused and sent to prison. They might have uh, argued with a party leader and been sent there. Uh, some might have been sent there on trumped up charges. And let's, let's perfectly be honest here some probably for petty crime. This facility is not the type that you would send hardened criminals to. Those facilities are, are much different and they look quite different than these. Um, we need to find out who put them there and we need to bring them to justice. I, uh, I've taken up around 20 minutes or so, I believe. And I would like to open up to questions to anything you might have to ask and I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. If I can't, uh, Greg or Amanda might be able to uh, address those questions. Uh, I wanna point out that uh, I am primarily an imagery analyst. Uh, Amanda and Greg uh, are those who handle the, uh, the political and the human rights issues primarily. Thank you. Joe, thank you so much. Terrific presentation of the report. Before we move to the Q&A, and uh, I'm going to invite everyone to ask questions through the Q&A function if possible, let me remind everyone, especially our colleagues in the press, I see that DOA and RFA are represented, they're pretty much carrying the torch um, of uh, North Korean human rights as far as the Korean language press is concerned. Uh, my colleague Rosa Park, Director of Programs, has posted the link to the report in the chat she has also posted the link to the 3D video and the link, uh, well, and some instructions pertaining to the 3D video. Um, Joe, you have uh, mentioned that uh, 3D uh, rendition produced by our colleague, uh, Nathan Hunt. This is actually the first time, it's a, it's a very first for HRK, it's the first time that we also uh, produce a 3D video in conjunction with a satellite imagery report uh, produced by, uh, by you, Joe. And uh, the fundamental intention is to give uh, a, a better impression, a better rendering of what things actually look like uh, on the ground. So before we move on to the Q&A, uh, Rosa, if you're ready, please proceed with the video. The video, by the way, is narrated by Amanda Morquito. This is a model of the Pokchangni detention facility. It is believed to be part of North Korea's long-term prison labor facility number eight at Sungho Ri. Long-term prison labor facility number eight is located approximately 25 kilometers east of the capital city of Pyongyang and consists of a small number of dispersed detention facilities, including this Pokchangni detention facility. This model builds on a previous Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, or HRNK, satellite imagery report by expert imagery analyst Joseph S. Bermudez Jr. and HRNK interviews with former prisoners in September 2020 and April 2019. These efforts were conducted to provide a more detailed understanding of North Korea's detention facilities. Available information indicates that during the early 2000s, long-term prison labor facility number eight was organized into a headquarters with seven detention facilities dispersed within Sungho Guyuk. These facilities were identified by a former prisoner as prison number one through number seven. A former prisoner has identified prisons number two and three as being within this Pokchangni detention facility. This long-term prison labor facility, or Kyohua So, has undergone changes, as detailed in HRNK's latest satellite imagery report, available at hrnk.org, dated July 22, 2021. 
Long-term prison labor facility number eight is reported to be subordinate to the Prisons Bureau, also called the Correctional Education Bureau of the Ministry of Social Security, previously named the Ministry of People's Security. In 2014, the UN Commission of Inquiry Chair, Justice Michael Kirby, stated, Although these labor camps might be described as ordinary prisons, there is nothing ordinary in the treatment of those incarcerated there. HRNK interviewed a former prisoner at the Pok Chung Ni detention facility, finding evidence of extermination, starvation, torture, enslavement, and forced labor. Reportedly, prisoners here are made to work under long and difficult conditions without enough food. In the export unit, prisoners were forced to affix eyelashes on dolls from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. daily. Prisoners in other units were forced to conduct difficult manual labor in the fields, nearby cement factory, and in the limestone and coal mines. What you see here is an attempt to showcase the reality of life inside North Korea's prison camps. This virtual model, however, cannot fully capture the extent of human suffering, but what it does illuminate are the stark facilities, the high prison walls, and the guard towers, helping to confirm the overall confinement of many people who are imprisoned in North Korea without basic human rights. HRNK requests that North Korea grant immediate, free, and unimpeded access to international humanitarian organizations to provide assistance to the most vulnerable groups, including prisoners, as per Ireland's May 2019 Universal Periodic Review recommendation, which North Korea supported. HRNK will continue to monitor and model North Korea's prison camps and work to improve human rights for North Koreans. If you would like to contribute to our satellite imagery project with more information on North Korea's detention facilities, contact us at outreach at hrnk.org. Please also subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive more content like this and support our work. Many thanks to Nathan Hunt, who worked under the supervision of Joe Bermudez, and to our colleague, Amanda Mortwood O, for her work on this project. She's a HRN case human rights attorney and also project officer under our satellite imagery project, and to the entire HRNK team, of course. Um, Joe, we, uh, we, we do have a few questions already, and uh, the first two questions come from the press from uh, Sohe Jun is with uh, Radio Free Asia. The first mm -hmm. question is, what was the initial <coughs> interest in the ultimate objective of this long-term project? If you also want me to jump in, I'll do that as well. I'll, we'll go to you first. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, uh, I, as an, I can talk to my uh, particular uh, concerns. Uh, at the end of World War II, my father had uh, uh, the opportunity, I don't know if that's the right word, but he uh, visited several of the camps as a member of the U.S. Army. And he subsequently, uh, first as a military policeman and then with counterintelligence, uh, was responsible for tracking down Nazis. And uh, his descriptions of the camps to me uh, remain uh, to this day. Uh, I was quite horrified because my father felt that I, I should know the raw facts. And he gave them to me very, very raw. And he instilled in me the desire that uh, such atrocities should not occur again. And I had a uh, distinct uh, interest in North Korea. And when Greg and I met approximately 10 years ago, we, uh, we talked and we put our interest together and from my perspective, uh, that's what led to the imagery analysis project. And it, you know, at a personal level, it gave me the opportunity uh, to stand against injustice, to stand against inhumane uh, treatment of people. Uh, there are many places in the world that have situations that are horrible. Uh, I, as an individual, don't have resources to do all of them. And my interest was in Korea. And that's why I focused here. And Amanda or somebody else can address the uh, former prisoner testimony. The, uh, 
if, if I may add a couple of things, which you just said, Joe, uh, please, please. you have been a true blessing to this cause and to the people of North Korea. From our viewpoint, this has been an extraordinarily effective method and methodology, combining the satellite imagery analysis that Joe Bermudez provides with uh, PSKP testimony. Why are we doing this? We are doing this, first of all, to document and monitor the detention facilities of North Korea. It is very important to know what's going on in order to address North Korea. In the process, awareness building is also very important. We have all of these reports going out. A humongous amount of work goes into these reports. Just imagine, and even now with so many reports still published after the February 2014 report of the UNCOI, this cause of North Korean human rights is still struggling for attention. It's always the, the political, security, military issues that outcompete human rights. Now imagine a world without Joe Bermudez producing these reports uh, with HRMK. Imagine that this material were not out there. Would we even stand a chance to focus attention on North Korean human rights? Of course, there are two other very important issues, and, and Joe has already alluded to one of them. There's the issue of supply chain. When your little kid holds a, a doll made in China, and when your little kid looks at those eyelashes on that doll, does it ever cross our mind that that doll might have been produced with forced labor, slave labor, prison labor in North Korea? We've published a report by Kim Kwang Jin, non-resident senior fellow in North Korean SKP, Gulag Incorporated. We, we basically certified that the, the mineral supply chain in North Korea, coal and mineral supply chain is tainted by forced labor. The same applies to, for example, toys and dolls and so many other products. Finally, and Joe, you have mentioned the Holocaust and that, that your father's service in bringing justice to those who committed genocide. We are doing this to document, to provide documentation for a future transitional justice process because eventually change will come to the Korean Peninsula. Joe, uh, we can, you're absolutely right, turn over to Amanda who has interviewed um, even the, these KPs who are quoted in this report. So Amanda, um, Sohe Jun would like to hear more about prisoner testimony and the, the brutal violations of human rights that the former prisoners shared. Some of these are included in this report as well on page three under extermination and starvation. Amanda, camera on, camera off, it's entirely up to you. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Greg. I hope you can hear me. Um, thanks, Joe. Loud and clear, thank you. Okay, thanks, Joe and Rosa. Uh, your mic is off, Amanda. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to highlight the voices of those who uh, we interviewed in Seoul. Um, it's been about two years ago now. Uh, it was really remarkable to hear their testimony and just um, their strength coming through and what they had, had suffered and what they still wanted to share. And, you know, our intent was to document the abuses and, and look at that transitional justice process, as you mentioned, Greg, um, and of course, to think about accountability mechanisms. And um, in addition, just really, we want to elevate their voices and bring light to the conditions and what they've gone through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Joe, the next question comes from one of our own, from Sandra Scarlatti. Is there significance to the purple and blue colored roofs in the video? And secondly, it's also about detail, are the human figures illustrated or silhouettes? Uh, are those guards or prisoners? Joe, please unmute your mic. Yes, oh, I did. <laughs> uh, excellent questions, and I'll address them in a moment. Uh, I just want to refer back to um, the video 
that Amanda had produced and presented. You, if you look at the interior walls of the prison, you will notice that approximately three meters from the security wall, there is a fence, a barbed wire fence. And this fence is to keep uh, prisoners from approaching the actual security wall. And I haven't heard it about this particular camp, but in other camps, we've been told that uh, prisoners who approach that fence or try to you know, touch it or go past it are shot. Now, uh, this detail is seen in some of the satellite imagery. When we zoom in, we can just barely see the post for the barbed wire fence. And this is one of the things we look at when we're trying to determine if a, a structure or a facility is a, a detention facility. And in the beginning of the report, you'll see that the other things we look for are um, certain structures, uh, that there are gates that isolate the prison and that there are guard posts. And you'll see in that video, there were guard towers around. So keep that in mind when you look at the report and when you look at the video online. To Sandra's question about the roofs, um, I honestly don't know. We uh, see in many facilities, not only uh, detention facilities, but industrial facilities, we see bright blue roofs and bright red, bright red roofs. Uh, one person has speculated that the blue roofs are provided in general by the government under a government program, and the red roofs are under a program by the Korean Workers' Party. Uh, I have no way to confirm this at this time. Uh, I, most uh, defectors, escapees, and former prisoners that I've spoken with just say it was a new roof. <laughs> so uh, it is something that I will uh, keep in mind uh, as I go forward. In the video, those uh, silhouettes of people were inserted to present a sense of scale for the viewer. Uh, don't necessarily represent either a prisoner or a person of the administration or guard force. Joe, thank you very much. Uh, Nathan sent us a very nice note by the chat function. He's honored to be on the team. We're delighted to have him on the team and look forward to the next 3D rendition of the next report. Uh, thank you for that question, Sandra. Uh, th that's a question we're going to ask moving ahead. We'll have to ask about the part of those rooms. Nathan did pay a lot of close attention to detail. He even asked a question at some point about the, the machine gun that should be placed uh, in the guard tower. And our answer was the, the Type 73, the, the best known North Korean submachine gun. So, um, and as we proceed with this project, there will also be more detail, a better understanding, an opportunity to better understand what's going on inside these facilities. Uh, Joe, a question from Robert. Uh, could you please elaborate on the difference between the facilities for hardened criminals and the type of facility, the, the Kyohaso facility that you introduced today? Okay, I'll try to address that uh, question in a moment. Uh, I wanna step back, you know, it might seem silly for someone to ask about the colors of the roofs, uh, but it isn't. Um, we want, in, in this program, we want to find out who is responsible what organization was responsible? Who was in charge of that organization? And if in fact the, the uh, unconfirmed report that uh, blue roofs are from you know, government organizations and red are from the party, well, that tells us we need to look in two different branches. A lot of this you know, might seem trivial, but when you're building a case, when you're building evidence, little things like this are important. One of the great aspects of the project is we're building an evidentiary chain of a facility. The fact that a facility, a building in a facility was there one year and it's not there the next year is important. Well, if it wasn't there and now it's there, this is an objective fact. It's there, it's not there. There's a barbed wire fence, there's not a barbed wire fence. These are important things 
when a, we go to trial on this. And it is our hope that we can bring justice to the situation. With that said, um, if you look at the, uh, the traditional prisons, they, uh, they're massive, they're big, they're large. The large facilities, high uh, exterior security wall. Internally, many of them are star shaped with you know brick or concrete uh, holding cell areas. So if you were to look down, and uh, eventually in this project we will cover some of those also. Uh, you look down, you see a square or a rectangle, I should say. In the center, you see a star shaped a central uh, building with um, barracks or cell blocks radiating out, multi-story, you know, typically three stories tall. Uh, and these have been uh, modernized over time. We, you know, I'm thinking of one that is in uh, Hungnam that was torn down and, or was replaced by a larger, more substantial one. There's another one in Seriwon. Uh, there's another one in Pyongsang, just north of Pyongyang. And we see activity at these also. In fact, we see uh, more vehicles at these. Uh, as to the prisoners, what I've been generally told, and I haven't verified it, uh, is that these are for criminals. You know, someone, you know, beats up somebody else. It has nothing to do with politics. It, it's go to prison. You know, someone who uh, steals, they could go either place. You know, uh, repetitive theft would go there. Uh, corruption, corruption can go either way from what we've been told. Uh, it depends on the severity. Uh, and if it's really severe, you just get executed. Yeah. We, uh, if you look back at our publications, uh, we had a report that showed the actual political execution of a senior official a number of years ago. Uh, made worldwide news, that image and that reporting from Greg and I. I'm sorry I couldn't answer more, but this is, this is on the agenda when uh, Amanda does additional interviews to, to ask these questions. Uh, this is not a static project. This is a, an ongoing evolving project with the overall intention to document and to report on the human rights situation in North Korea and the detention facilities. So you'll see changes as we move forward. You saw us correct ourselves. You saw me correct myself from the Pukjang Mi report until this report. It's because it's not because we were um, you know, sloppy, right? It's that we acquired new information. We're not afraid to tell the truth as best as we can. If that means we have to update something, we're going to do it. The people of North Korea deserve this. Thank you, Joe. And most importantly, uh, we should not be expected to have breaking news every time we produce one of these update reports. I hear this a lot. So what's the news? Well, sometimes there is no news, but sometimes there is change. Sometimes there is dramatic change. And Joe, I, I should have mentioned early on that your work was uh, critical to the work of the UN Commission of Inquiry, in particular toward the later okay. stages. They requested imagery analysis, it played an important role. You testified before the UN Commission of Inquiry. They had four public hearings in Seoul, Tokyo, London, Washington. Joe Bermudez testified in Washington. And this project, our satellite imagery project, has enabled, we hope, us and other human rights organizations and human rights defenders to, to maintain the momentum created by the UN Commission of Inquiry. Uh, we continue to receive requests, including a very recent one from, well, I cannot name them or identify them. Uh, for example, very senior um, international organization officials who uh, were very interested both in the satellite imagery and our work with North Korean state peaks. We continue to learn, we continue to develop, we continue to um, produce a comprehensive understanding of the mechanism, the North Korean mechanism of human rights denial. Uh, I'd like to add just one quick thing. 
Uh, Greg hasn't mentioned it, but over the past 10 years, he has mentored numerous interns here at HRNK. And it's important for they're going to carry the torch you know, forward after you know, Greg and I are gone. Uh, building up uh, a cadre of trained and dedicated people is important. And they, they do a lot of the grunt work, uh, to be honest. We're preparing two reports right now, and they've done all the grunt work, and I've provided imagery and some tutoring. Uh, but these interns are going to go forward with a, with a good, solid knowledge of how to do these sort of things, and also hopefully a passion and spread the word, not only about human rights abuses in North Korea, but about human rights in general around the world. Thank you, Joe. And Emily Spa, former intern, says eternally grateful for HRNK. Uh, I do think that that mentoring uh, of uh, young, passionate, um, young professionals is extraordinarily important. You have been spending a lot of time teaching and training them. Another question that I hear, uh, Joe, is um, what have we learned? What is the big picture? What have you learned through this project combining imagery and uh, testimony, for example, under Kim Jong-un. Well, all of these trends are always included in our reports because every facility that we research is part of this big picture. For example, an intensified crackdown on attempts to escape from North Korea. We identified this trend many years ago. Things got much, much worse under COVID, of course. Uh, based on the work of Joe Bermudez, a restructuring of the political prison camp system, facilities close to the border with China being shut down, uh, inland facilities being expanded, prisoners being transferred, prisoners disappearing in the process. Uh, the sustained, if not increased importance, uh, economic importance of the camps. And uh, Joe Bermudez spoke about this particular facility and its role in uh, producing uh, dolls uh, shipped to China or in, in the extractive industry in North Korea's coal industry. The disproportionate repression of women. Remember, women are the ones primarily who uh, have been market agents. They've assumed primary responsibility for the survival of the families. They're the ones who go to China, get arrested, forcibly repatriated to a place where they face a credible fear of persecution. Joe, you mentioned that the report on the execution of senior officials uh, using ZPU-4 anti-aircraft machine guns with bodies being pulverized and turned into pink mist. We've spoken to numerous uh, North Korean escapees who say who witnessed such executions. It's a gruesome thing to say, but they say, uh, you know, the funny thing is uh, only the feet are left. Only the feet and the boots. That's all you see. So this was also documented through both imagery and escaping testimony, um, especially under COVID and increased, well, increased restrictions <clears throat> placed on information flows, uh, deliberate targeting of North Korean escapees, uh, a crackdown on so-called anti-revolutionary and reactionary thoughts. And here, other branches and other areas of research here, for example, the the information environment of North Korea come in. So everything is part of a continuum. The desk research, interviews with North Korean escapees and our satellite imagery analysis work as well. Well, do we have any more questions from the audience? Well, if we, uh, if we do not have any more questions from the audience, um, let me, uh, let me thank everyone who has joined us today. Uh, I see a lot, a lot of good friends. I see Dr. Malvinati Lake in Michigan. I see uh, a good friend Tim Peters in South Korea. It's uh, quite early in the morning, Tim. So happy you joined us. Um, Dr. Maya Devine, uh, Professor Jerry Nelson. It's uh, very good to see him and so many other friends. Uh, and supporters of HRNK. Um, Amanda uh, reminds me that you have not addressed the question between the Palisol and the Kyoaso yet. I, uh, I think I got a little bit overly enthusiastic yet. So let me go back to you, Joe. 
uh, <laughs> I think Greg is probably the better at this uh, than I am. Uh, Lee so uh, tend to be much larger and tend to be associated with a, uh, a, a more industrial production aspect. You, you know, we would say slave labor, whereas the, uh, the colossal tend to be smaller, dispersed, and the, the Kwan Lee So tend to be uh, consolidated. But some of these are large, I mean, huge. Uh, one is, uh, I think, 55 square miles in mountainous terrain. Uh, and most of these activities that are undertaken there uh, tend to be coal mining and production of cement, production of tiles, uh, things of that nature. Uh, whereas the, uh, the COSO are, if they're involved in industrial activity, uh, it's, it's almost always mining if it, it is industrial activity, but some have been associated with small machine shop and wood shops. For example, uh, producing furniture, producing bicycles, that sort of thing. The prisoners, uh, I, I don't have that much insight into that. Uh, that's something that Amanda and Greg tend to do. Uh, but we see that uh, there are some you know, broad differences. So uh, those who are caught trying to escape to China uh, tend to be in camps further north, uh, or there is the uh, Chungsan uh, facility on the west coast, west northwest of Yangyang, where a number of uh, women were put in certain facilities within that larger camp uh, who had tried to escape. Uh, there were probably multiple offenders, if I remember correctly, but Greg and Amanda could certainly uh, address that question better than I can. That was terrific, Joe. Um, basically, uh, the prisoners at a quality so are victims of enforced disappearances. You're taken away in the middle of the night, oftentimes with members of the family, up to three generations of the same family, pursuant to the Yon Jojo system of guilt by association. Uh, some of them are imprisoned at what they call the total control zones. They don't get out ever. Some of them are imprisoned at so-called revolutionizing zones, where there is a certain element of re-education. There is a chance that you might um, be allowed to leave. So no, no prison sentences at the, at the Kualiso. Uh, these are those wrongdoers, wrong thinkers, those perceived as having engaged in wrong associations that, for example, David Park has addressed in his reports. Uh, those at the Kyoha so do receive a prison sentences. So there is a semblance of a judicial process. And if you look at the North Korean criminal code, the Kyoha Hyung, re-education for labor, is a, a quite common punishment applied in North Korea. But now, whenever in the press or academia you hear about the political prison camps, you hear the number, 80,000 to 120,000 currently. What we have discovered through the work of Joe Bermudez and those interviews that Amanda Morkwood and our other colleagues have done with this KPs is that political prisoners are held at the Kyoha So camps as well, not only at the Kuali So. So the number of political prisoners is actually much higher than just the number of those who are held at the Kuali So political prison camps. Very quick example, Joe. You remember the, the rapid assessment that you did of Kyoha So number 12 in Chongori uh, mm -hmm. after flooding. Um, 800 of 1,000 women in prison there were women forcibly returned from China in direct violation of the 1951 UN Refugee Convention because they were returned to a place where they faced a credible fear of persecution. They could, of course, be classified as political prisoners. They merited access to the process leading to acquiring political refugee status. Instead, they were just repatriated to North Korea. Um, Tim Peters, uh, thanks you, Joe, very much, and has a question. Thank you. Uh, the dolls were clearly for export to China. How about coal and limestone? 
Good question. Uh, honestly, don't know the answer to that. Uh, normally what's ex exported is coal and rare earth minerals. Uh, limestone, I'm not so sure. I don't think I've seen that any of the border crossings. I've seen coal, I've seen um, gondolas with uh, rare earth minerals and, and they're slightly different than coal gondolas. And we do see boxcars going across and we just don't know what's in those at this point in time. Uh, I wish I could, uh, I, I could give you a better answer. One of our challenges, probably the biggest challenge is uh, we're a small group with uh, limited resources. If we had more resources, we could do more. It, and we have to, uh, we have to pick our, our subject for the reports uh, carefully. Uh, you know, to add to what uh, Greg was saying, the thing that has impressed me uh, is that there are so many of these facilities. You know, we have a list of, you know, at least 20, 30, Amanda might correct me, maybe even more uh, facilities, small facilities scattered around the country that we have, there is no public information. Uh, some escapees and former prisoners talk about a facility. We unfortunately can't identify it, locate it. We did a general area and then we look and we come up with several candidates, but then to go dig deep takes time and resources. And uh, we're doing the best we can. We're, we're trying to get to them. But the size of the overall detention facilities, prison facilities in North Korea is remarkable. It, it truly is. Great. Uh, let me remind everyone that uh, our colleague Rosa Park has posted a link to a Venn diagram that details the differences and similar similarities between the Kyohatso and the Kualiso camps. That's in the chat. Um, the next two questions. Uh, Nathan is asking if there is any information regarding the eyelashes and hair on dogs. He wonders if they might have been made from hair from prisoners. Well, we have had testimony on previous occasions that uh, wigs were made by prisoners out of the hair of prisoners. As far as I know, and I could turn it over to uh, Amanda since she's the one who ran the interviews, as far as I know, there is no testimony that the eyelashes were produced from at that particular facility. They were just asked to basically um, attach the eyelashes, but that doesn't mean that they were not produced at a different facility uh, from human hair, prisoner hair. Uh, definitely a good question to ask uh, moving ahead. A question from Rick, and I can turn this over to Amanda and, uh, and Joe as well. Rick Hersevoort, our colleague in the Netherlands, our European liaison. Uh, do many products made in North Korean prison camps make their way to Europe and North America via China? A, a common sense answer would be yes, most likely. And that means that not only us, CSO, civil society organizations, but of course those concerned with, um, with sanctions, uh, governmental entities also have to pay more attention to these issues. Uh, anything that touches North Korea is a tainted supply chain. And that would be the, the, the short answer. Um, Amanda, shall we go to you before we circle back to Joe? Joe, would you like to go first? Amanda. I think Amanda should go because I have really no information on that. <laughs> okay, sure. The uh, interview, you did not mention where the hair was made, just said that in this particular export unit, they were doing this type of work. The person did say that in all of these camps, the Kyoha So, there is always an export unit where people are made to work and then they believe that the goods are then um, exported to China. Thank you very much, Amanda. So the possibility is there, that said, this would have been a, a big 
piece of evidence. If that had happened at the same facility, Amanda, I believe that they would have mentioned it. But it, it doesn't preclude the possibility that the eyelashes may be produced at a different detention facility. Uh, I am going to take, Joe, we're going a little bit over time, but I'm going to take one final question from Karen, Karen Cardenas. Um, sanitary conditions uh, were described as uh, terrible. Um, I, I guess it's, well, it might be difficult now, even more difficult due to the COVID-19 restrictions. Okay. Uh, do you have any information about how COVID restrictions might affect sanitary conditions at these detention facilities? I am going to answer this one. We don't know. Access has been extraordinarily difficult under COVID. All NGO personnel was sent out of North Korea. All UN personnel was sent out of North Korea. Most embassy personnel sent out of North Korea. Of course, we still have sources that we can contact inside the country by a variety of means. And even that has become very difficult. That's why satellite imagery is so important. Despite a relative decline in access to sources on the ground, we are still able to produce these reports. It's a great research question, uh, answering Karen Cardenas, and it's, it's a question that we will continue to, to keep in focus moving forward. So uh, before I, uh, I thank, of course, Joe for everything he has done for the past decade for the cause of uh, North Korean human rights, let me, uh, let me thank uh, my colleagues. All of them have been involved in this process, as Joe said, there are so many interns who have participated and contributed to this and other reports and other HRK initiatives. We're grateful to all of them, and we look forward to following their careers as human rights defenders and growing young professionals. Um, I would like to thank in particular our colleagues, Amanda Mortlet O and Rosa Parr for their work um, on, this, uh, on this report. Rosa, also thank you for running this program as uh, Director of Programs for HRNK. Uh, special thanks go to uh, a, a very senior member of this community, Mr. Al Allen Anderson, uh, a veteran imagery analyst who has been truly dedicated to this organization. Our mission has helped a lot from behind the scenes. Also, uh, two other veteran imagery analysts, uh, Ronald Bonneler and Bobby Holt, uh, who have also helped out. Uh, former colleagues, Hyun Yoon, Han Jun Kim, Sua Lee, and uh, Cha Chon Min. Thank you all. This is another terrific uh, Joe Bermuda's production. Well, I don't know if the word terrific is <laughs> the work. It's not about the facilities, unfortunately. So uh, Joe's wish to me and all of us and my wish to Joe is that the day when we no longer have to monitor these facilities uh, came closer. But until then, this documentation and monitoring a project will continue. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for spending this precious time with us. Thank you.